she was remarkable. She touched many, 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 many people. She gave away millions of dollars when she was alive. And for the most part, no one knew it. Edith Gaylord was a woman of such broad interest. She talked about lots of things. That it was politics, it was society, it was what was going on in the community, it was sometimes business. She just had causes all her life. She made the contributions that she wanted to, that she felt would make a difference, but she didn't need any big recognition about what she was doing. A, a person who had strong views, a, a solidified ideology, she knew what she wanted. She had an incredible heart. She always asked me about my family. Uh, she wanted to make sure that not only were we doing the job we were hired to do, but that, uh, that we were okay personally. She was a direct person. She spoke her mind, or she um, didn't say anything. On the outside, Edith was very direct. On the inside, she was a marshmallow. Passionate about giving, passionate about people, passionate about education, and um, about life. Here's a woman who decides, I've got plenty, my family has plenty, I'm going to set up two foundations. I'm literally going to leave everything to them. It's all going to go to the foundations for charity. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. She said she had printer's ink in her blood. Oklahoma City was undergoing a reinvention from 1898 to 1910. The original land run generation had lost their energy when our population had dropped by 98, and suddenly in 98 and 99, the city starts growing. And an entire generation of leadership comes to Oklahoma City. And one of those leaders who comes to Oklahoma City in 1903 is E. K. Gaylord comes from Colorado. He buys a quarter interest in a newspaper that has been here since 89, The Oklahoman. That is his foothold in Oklahoma City. As a young state, Oklahoma and its history is very much a history of families, particularly great families. And I would contend that there's no greater family in the history of Oklahoma than the Gaylord family. Well, when you say publishing in Oklahoma, uh, uh, the Gaylord name, uh, always comes to mind, and it should always come to mind because there was the pioneering part of it. There was no guarantee that the Daily Oklahoma, which had competition at the time, was going to make it. He risked everything. His idea, I think, was to create a newspaper that was not just for Oklahoma City, but a paper that had influence all over Oklahoma. What we knew about journalism and quality and stature was from the Gaylord family, not just in newspapers, but in broadcasting too. They saw themselves as playing a role uh, in, in, the, in the building of a brand new state, a brand new society, and trying to help shape its, its, its values as well and the, the direction of that state. The classmate of E.K. Gaylord wrote him and said that this young lady was coming down to Oklahoma City to run the Y, and when he, and she didn't know anybody, would be, he please introduce her around. So anyway, he met her, and I don't think he ever introduced her to anybody else, but he did, but he married her, and that's, that was Edith's mother. They met through a service to others. She had been working for the YWCA nationally, and he was starting his newspaper business, and the two of them seemed to have started from the get-go that community service, that the community could not be built if the community service, if the inhabitants were taken care of. Edith was one of three children that E.K. Gaylord and his wife had. The oldest was Edith Gaylord, next came Edward L., and then there was Virginia. We found lots of pictures going through our family archives where Edith um, was just kind of doting on her father and loved to celebrate with him. She was really a daddy's girl. And I love Edith Kenny Gaylord. I, that's just such a beautiful name. The middle name is her, is her mom's uh, maiden name. 
The initials are EKG, just like her father. She had a public school education until she was 12 years old. And at that time, and I think her mother greatly influenced the decision, she went to Switzerland. Our grandmother actually told her in the, these letters that she understood, and essentially she gave Edith her blessing, which was so far ahead of both of their times. And was going to a boarding school, a finishing school, as some people called it. It was the Vanette School. They trained the mind. She had uh, language. And most important, I think, she was taught critical thinking. She grew up in a family that discussed ideas, probably had some interaction, probably had some debate around the dinner table. Well, then she went on to Colorado College, which uh, uh, had been her father's school. Colorado College was an organization very important to Edith. She was a longtime trustee. Edith really felt strong ties to Colorado. I remember she told me that she had a contract with her family that if they would let her attend Colorado College for two years, she'd go east. She told me, and her friends confirmed it, that when she was at Colorado College, she was just having too much fun. They didn't think she was quite uh, uh, producing as uh, uh, up to the extent of her capabilities, but she said it sure was fun. Then she did transfer to Wells and completed her education there. It made perfect sense that when she grew up that she would want to be a journalist. Well, the only problem is when she grew up, there weren't women journalists. There was a glass ceiling for women. This was a man's world. The phone rang and the newspaper notified E.K. that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. So she left and went in the car, drove down to the newspaper office, and uh, began to see what she could do to help. So she went into the library and spent much of the rest of the day pulling material for writers and reporters who were doing follow-up stories on the Japanese attack. I'm sure that was probably the major story that broke that she got to work on. rainy, snowy, cold day down at the paper when they were picketing the paper. They, they had a strike on. And she got out of her car to go in to work that morning in the paper, and she realized that one of the women that she knew was very cold and didn't have a coat on because the cold front had come in as they were picketing. So she takes her coat off and gives it to this picketer who's holding a big sign up that says, you know, we hate the Daily Oklahoman or something. And she says, no, no, you've got to be warm. And she takes her own coat off and gives it to her. Edith had a wonderful career in journalism. I know it was a lot harder when she started than it is today, happily, for, for women. Edith truly was a pioneer. It's a pioneer. But a pioneer. Strong single women were rather rare particularly in this part of the country. She considered herself a journalist. She was very much one of the crowd. She was there with old friends. She was not there as a member of the Gaylord family. We own the Daily, not at all. She was absolutely one of them. I certainly did look up to her, that she was a first in so many arenas. Her dad, when she came back from college, suggested that she go down and work in the society department at the paper. And that's essentially where most women worked who were doing reporting and writing. She applies for a job with the AP, the Associated Press, the gold standard in the world of newspapers. She goes off to the East Coast and is hired as one of the first women um, on the general news staff at the Associated Press. They thought it would be appropriate if a woman would cover Eleanor Roosevelt, so Edith got that assignment. She conspired with Eleanor Roosevelt to, you know, to create a, a real presence and a niche and something for women journalists in Washington that the men couldn't do. She was a confidant and advisor to Eleanor Roosevelt, and we all know that she was the greatest confidant and advisor to the President of the United States. Eleanor Roosevelt uh, uh, apparently just thought the world of Edith, and I know she felt the same way about Mrs. Roosevelt. She becomes the president of the Women's Press Association. And the night of a, her inauguration, that would sure be nice, 
if she could get the president's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, to come and deliver a speech. Mrs. Roosevelt said, Edith, uh, yeah. An orchid. She knew that Eleanor was taller than she was. So Edith was worried that she'd look so short with Mrs. Roosevelt, so she put the orchid in her hair. So that would give her more height. This was an awful decision that she made. She regretted it because there was a photograph taken. Thought there was the worst picture ever taken of that uh, orchid sticking in her hair. She never did, she wished that she hadn't done that. June 16, 1944. Last evening, I went to the Women's National Press Club dinner, where Mrs. Elizabeth May Craig turned over the presidency of the club for the coming year to Miss Edith Gaylord, Eleanor Roosevelt. Suddenly, she has this opportunity. She gets to cover Madame Chiang Kai-shek, another independent-minded woman who is touring the country. And here is this little girl from Oklahoma City covering Madame Chiang Kai-shek for the AP. Vivid, sunlit colors of flags and costumers flashed against the lush green of San Francisco's Civil Center as thousands of Chinese paraded for more than an hour Thursday past a flower-banked City Hall balcony to welcome Madame Chiang Kai-shek. The wife of the Chinese Generalissimo told them and additional thousands in the square that the welcome had literally left me speechless and breathless. I said, how'd you do that? And she said, you gotta push. There had been years of trying to get women into the National Press Club. And as you know, Edith was instrumental in creation of the Washington Press Club, which was the club formed by women when the National Press Club wouldn't admit us. And I thought, wow, you can be a hardcore journalist you can be the kind of person who's caring about accuracy and all of those things, but you can also be the kind of person who goes out and does the things that people really need to know about. I believe that she developed much of her early advocacy for women and the underdogs by listening to all of that and seeing this world of men, knowing that she could do it herself. Being on the general news desk, of the AP in New York. There weren't many assignments in this country in daily journalism that could be more prestigious, but also more pressure packed than that one. She must have been good at it, because it can't have been easy. The people above her having enough confidence to send her to Washington, where again, she covered the most important family in the world. That's a big deal. Now her portrait hangs in the National Press Club in Washington that women didn't used to be able to be members, but since she was a president of the Women's Press Club and one of the founders, she's now then finally considered to be one of the uh, presidents and founders of the National Press Club. Now, Edith was a good sport. I will never forget going to the White House with her. And it was just the two of us to a dinner. My husband was a gridiron club, and their big gridiron dinner, it was all male. So the wives were shoved out, and Pat Nixon invited all the wives and their guests for dinner at the White House. So I picked up Edith in our blue Volkswagen, and we had these fluffy dresses on, and they practically filled up the whole front seat of the Volkswagen, and we were just giggling. She was a good sport about it. And in those days, you could drive in to the White House lawn, to the back of the White House. You can't do it now. So we sailed in in the blue Volkswagen, and parked, and as we got out and we're starting to go up the driveway, we looked back and giggled because the Volkswagen was parked in the middle of all these limos. And we laughed all the way up to the White House. What better way to describe Oklahoma City than a city on the march? People on the move. Edith came back to Oklahoma at her father's request to, uh, to learn more about the paper and the business. And Edith, I think, was ready to come home. E.K., the founder of Oklahoma Publishing Company, has her in as corporate secretary, but she's part of what's happening with the newspaper. So she's in a position to see what's going on. She came back and was the quiet philanthropist. She never wanted anybody to know who gave it. It was completely anonymous. Her giving inspired me and I, I, but she was so private that 
You didn't know a lot of things she gave. She brought back all of her knowledge, her outside friends and resources. She wanted to be thoughtfully involved in the things that she gave to. For Edith, I think it just caused her to have this wonderful pride and wonderful sense of accomplishment. I think she just wanted to be able to be available to help someone that needed the help. From the very beginning, I had a inward feeling that she was someone that I could confide in. And she was always willing to listen and to offer advice. She never missed our birthdays. And I don't know about you, but when I was a teenager, she'd take me out to lunch about once a year. and to just the cellar? <laughs> to the cellar or <laughs> Val Jeans. <laughs> I didn't get to do that. <laughs> but I can't underscore how much she took pleasure in and benefited from giving. She just loved it. One of her friendships that's always intrigued me is with a woman from Oklahoma named Angie DeBeau. Angie was farm girl from Oklahoma, bright, intelligent, independent-minded, did not want to stay on the farm, wanted to expand her horizons, much like Edith. And she really becomes an advocate for those who have been dispossessed, those who have not shared in the prosperity of the Oklahoma story up to this time. Well, Angie writes a book about dispossessing the Indians of their lands. Angie DeBow and Edith Gaylord were kindred spirits. I think they may have been each other's sheroes. Well, you can imagine how Edith would love Angie DeBow, because Angie DeBow was one of those women who believed in women's rights, but she also believed in the truth. Angie DeBow was a great woman historian, and uh, she was a trailblazer in her own right. She focused on Oklahoma itself. And she had the courage to tell some of the stories about the way things really happened. And how we had betrayed the Indians in so many ways. And she wrote about it very clearly and loudly. I believe it's the University of Oklahoma Press refused to, pre to even print her books finally because they were so truthful about the dark side of our history. She was not afraid to trample on the toes of some very influential people in this state. It was very controversial at the time she wrote. Some of those people were still living and some of them were donors to the University of Oklahoma. She told the stories about how some of the oil leases got acquired uh, on the cheap from people that didn't fully understand the value of their properties. And Edith had such a strong sense of justice. That was one of the things that motivated her. Everybody should have a fair chance. The human dignity of every individual was important, but she wanted the real story of history to be told. And she admired the fact that it was a woman who had the courage, as a trailblazing woman herself, to tell this story. And so I see these two ladies cut from the same bolt of cloth and when Angie passes away, Edith uses her foundations to set up a place to collect her works at Oklahoma State University. She endowed a prize at the OU Press, the Angie DeBeau Prize, that goes each year to the best historical work. Well, it was 1982, and the phone rang, and it was Bill Ross, and he said that uh, he had a client who wanted to meet with me, who was setting up a foundation. She said, well, I, I'd like to have two foundations. And would I be interested? And I said, well, yes, I mean, I'd tell me more. And he said, well, it's Edith. Edith was such a meticulous person, so detailed. And so when it came to the names of the foundations, you know she spent a ton of time thinking and thinking and thinking. Then she said she was going to name it the Inasmuch, and she asked us. You know what that means? I made some wild guess to remember what it was. She said, oh, come on, you can do better than that. It definitely was from the biblical verse and wanting to let the world know in as much as you have done it to the least of these. And I think that that is, that is the thing about Edith that is so amazingly outstanding. It's just extraordinarily impressive in terms of her humbleness, uh, but her power and her intent and the methodology by which she went through these very important steps uh, through many, many years to uh, have affected such an important, important uh, organization and force in this community and in this country. On the giving side, it's just amazing the difference we can make in, in, our, in our city and state. Education, early childhood, uh, women's issues. And then the other was ethics and excellence in journalism, which is pretty simple compared to the in as much. <laughs> is more uh, nationally uh, focused and it gives to numerous journalism schools and projects that those schools sponsor. 
Not very many foundations care about journalism itself, about quality information uh, in the service of the public. These names are headlines. You read in as much, you know it's going to concentrate on social justice, on education, on the arts. You read ethics in journalism, you know it's going to emphasize the essential nature of ethical journalism if a federal republic is going to be able to survive. The major funding of both foundations came through Edith's estate, so I think she had a, an idea that the foundations would do great things beyond her lifetime, but I think they've done that probably far more than any of us expected uh, when they were first created. She was wordsmithing, uh, always wordsmithing, and she was so gifted as a writer. When she spoke, it revealed a person who was very widely read. And if Edith said that was good, it was good. Not that she had to have everything perfect, but she had a certain way of doing things. Even though she had some strong views, she was actually um, quite analytical in the way she, she wanted things. She'd pull herself up to the table and clear her throat and she would say, gentlemen, gentlemen. It was almost like this silent, invisible force of oversight, of making sure things are done properly and done well and done in a pure, principled manner. You know, the wonderful thing about it was, every time we worked on something together, I learned from it. I knew that her views were not necessarily representing the family. Edith was, you know, more liberal than her brother. There was a part of him that said women should have a chance. And so maybe Edith had more effect on him than she thought. She was quite liberal. As a matter of fact, I think she helped found the ACLU in Oklahoma City. She and her brother always canceled each other's votes out. I know they would talk on the phone and kid about that and, and joke uh, to one another about the fact that it really doesn't matter to vote because they would just cancel each other's votes. He was the businessman. He was the journalist. They were in so many ways alike. Some people think they were opposites. They were opposites politically, but on a lot of fundamental things, setting high standards, intellectual brilliance, kind-hearted. They both wanted to do things without a lot of recognition. They were very fond of each other, and one thing that they obviously agreed upon was philanthropy. YWCA was incredibly important to Edith and their whole family. Her mother had worked for the YWCA in Ohio, and she'd raised the money for the Oklahoma City building. Edith really was a pioneer in that area. Her desire to help women and children couldn't be lived out in any better a way than through an emergency shelter that impacts their lives and saves lives. You know, we often think this is a subject that doesn't impact anybody that we know, yet when you look at those around us, we find the more we learn, the more we know that all of us know somebody. So Edith, by taking this on, really was an inspiration and said to, I think, women across the community, this is something you need to be paying attention to. So when we built that shelter, it was quite fitting that Edith named that after her mom, because that's really kind of where that tradition in Oklahoma began with her. As a Cub Scout in 1945, the National Scouts wanted us to be involved in the war effort. And the war effort basically for Scouts was doing things like collecting papers. And they persuaded General Eisenhower to let them create an award called the Eisenhower Medal to stimulate the Scouts to collect more paper. So I went on about five blocks down Avondale and came to the Gaylord home and knocked on the door and, and uh, Edith and Virginia were there. And they said, we have some nice papers and we'll get you some. So they go down the basement and they bring back bundles of carefully tied newspapers. They gave me enough to fill up my wagon. This went on for two or three weeks and I was talking about the Iris and Iron Metal. And finally, they said, why don't you call your father and ask him to bring his car around, we'll just fill it up. And so I, that was the basis ultimately, I think, of me getting enough paper, which was supposed to be a thousand pounds of paper, to justify being awarded the Eisenhower Medal, which was a very, it, when you're 11 years old, was a very important thing. How soon can you start for Colorado? 
I'll be ready within the hour, sir. When she came to Colorado Springs, it brought her back to her college days, and, and she just became a different person. The Gaylord family connection to the college going back to 1897. She was on the board of trustees and her affection for the college was profound. As a trustee, she wanted to know what was, what was really going on at the college. She was interested in what students were learning. She was interested in what faculty were teaching. She was interested in what faculty were doing with their research. She had read everything in the agenda book, which is certainly not necessarily what all trustees do. It just meant so much to me as the president to know that here's a trustee as alert and as curious and as interested in things as our students are. She endowed the Asian Studies program. She made it possible for that program to expand dramatically and to afford lots of opportunities for students and faculty here to go to the Far East and vice versa to bring people from China and Japan here. For the last three years, I have held the Lloyd Edson Warner Distinguished Service Professorship which she was largely responsible for funding. So I am the direct recipient of her beneficence. She contributed substantially to the development of the Baca campus in the San Luis Valley, which is a very distinctive part of Colorado College. The Cornerstone Building was really thought of as being a building that would integrate the arts. Drama, dance, any sort of film programs, art studios, so forth. It was a wonderful addition to the campus. And so it is a cultural focus in Colorado Springs, as well as being a major resource for students at Colorado College. She would return to Colorado Springs in the summer times and towards the latter part of her life, literally move into the Broadmoor for a couple months. She always stayed in room 312 and uh, she had the connecting room to that. She was very particular about how that room was arranged. The room wasn't set up like she wanted it set up. So I moved things around and situated things like that. Mr. Bartolin, she'd give me a call. Charlie would go up there and straighten it out. Before she came in, They'd set the room up. I would go in and check the room. She had to have a chair so she could look out the window. And the view would look west over the mountains and the lake. She liked that. And they would put, kept putting flowers in the room, and she was allergic to flowers. I said, look, I know what you want. If I don't move before she get here, somebody's going to have to move it when she get here. She would prefer the tavern restaurant, which is probably our most traditional restaurant. They had the table set up all beautiful and naturally. I said, first of all, do not touch her. She has arthritis real bad. She lived in a great deal of pain, but she maintained her dignity and her wit. I'd go up and she would say, I'd say, you don't just want to walk to the elevator? Do you think I can? I said, sure you can. I spread to grab her arm and try to help her up. So I said, I tell you what, I said, you like chicken? She looks at me. <laughs> I said, grab a wing. <laughs> she laughed and she grabbed my arm. <laughs> and from then on, when she wanted me to help her, she said, give me a wing. <laughs> and most people didn't see that side of her. She wasn't hard or difficult. She just, there was a certain thing she liked. And once we got that down, it was, she was very easy to take care of. Edith read in a newsletter from the Rocky Mountain Nature Association that benefits the Rocky Mountain National Parks. She read an article that they were raising money to buy a mule to work the trails in the parks. Doing this fundraising and they were gathering what they thought were gonna be bits and pieces of contributions. Well, she was so taken with the thought of um, being able to buy a mule that she paid the full amount to buy Carlos. She even added some extra amount in because she thought that he might need to go to mule school, was how she put it. And over the years, the executive director would frequently send her pictures of Carlos and what he was doing, the work on the trails, and there was always his name, you know, with the arrow, this, this one is Carlos, and she just had so much fun with that. David got a letter from Pam Flyshaker, and they had put together a wonderful, very valuable collection of Southwestern art. President David Bourne down at the University of Oklahoma called, and he said, there's an opportunity that is really tremendous for the university. He said, do you think Edith would be interested? And I said, well, let me check. So I called Edith and asked her. She said, well, certainly. She said, well, that sounds like a wonderful deal. She, of course, suffered so from arthritis that she could not come and look at the paintings where they were. Edith called, she says, what have you heard? I said, well, I haven't heard anything. She said, well, now we can't let this get away, so let's get it moving. We had to put together a book for her of very good transparencies of, of the paintings. I think I gave her the number, she called Born directly. So he took it to her, she looked at everything, she says, we've got to keep this here. This collection 
is of such a high standard that I really think it would bring about a complete change. It would really raise the bar for our art museum. It all turned out great because we did get the collection. It's now happily ensconced down to OU. And certainly a great buy for the university. Since that happened, at least 10 other major collections have come because we had credibility. It really was the building block for this university and this art museum, which by the way now is one of the three largest university art museums in the United States. Only Harvard and Yale are in our company. Edith was a very proud Oklahoman. She wanted Oklahoma to be everything it could be. Just look all around our state and you can see things that where Edith Gaylord made a difference. She received an honorary degree from OU. She would not have said she was proud of it, but if you know Edith, yes, she was proud of it. The Otis Sullivan Award is significant because it's really the last project Edith worked on before she died. She had a journalist friend that she was very close to, and she wants to set up a prize in his memory to honor him because she thought he was a wonderful person, he was a dear friend, and he had made an enormous contribution to journalism uh, in the state of Oklahoma. I was inspired to nominate someone for it. It could be a teacher, a staff member, a student. Did this person display, and this is her word, perceptivity? We had a custodian in our building, the head custodian, this brand new, beautiful building that was the envy of the campus and the envy of the world in journalism education. And I saw the care with which she was taking care of this building and how she would troubleshoot things and bring to our attention not short-term things, but worrying about the long-term, that something might not last or was decaying. And I thought, wow, to have an employee that dedicated, but cares as much or maybe more than, than those of us up on the executive level floor, she deserves special recognition. And the more I thought about this nomination, the more excited I became. This award to be given at an event that would be well attended, and she wanted this to be a very special award. One of the greatest days of my life was seeing that ceremony where Lorraine and all of her family came to a dinner, and there was the leadership of the entire university had assembled to give this woman the highest award the university had to offer. And it's given me even deeper satisfaction as I learn more about Edith Gaylord. And I thought, wow, that really was in sync with who this woman was. And I hope we can do more things like that in her memory. Bill Ross called me and he said, Edith wants to ask you something, but she doesn't want to put you on the spot. And she feels if she asks you herself, you'll have to say yes. She said, I want everything you have pre-written, obits, everything, pictures, etc. And he said, she wants you to agree to do the eulogy at her funeral uh, when she passes away. And I said, oh, Bill, I, you know, I said, it's, I can't think of anything that would honor me more. So I pulled everything up and I had a courier send him over because at that time she was bedridden. And she called me two days later, and she said, okay, let's go over this. She and I did sit down together. And uh, she, one of the things she made clear to me was, you know, I don't like a lot of fuss made over me. I was not the first woman president of the Women's Press Club. I was the second. Kate Graham was the first. I don't want you to glorify me. Present me just as the human being I am. Uh, with, with all of my flaws, please don't make me more than I am. Don't make me superhuman. And then she went on to give me other details that she felt weren't quite right. If anything, I, I hope you'll, you'll speak about some of the things that I passionately believe in because if you can use the service to get other people to help these causes, I believe. And she was thinking even then, how could her own memorial service be used to cause people to worry about people who were illiterate or people who were foreclosed because of racial prejudice or whatever it happened to be? Her interests were wide, education, the arts, racial and social issues, individual rights, and she delved into each of them with the same curiosity, sharp questions, and intellectual span that served her so well in her reporting days and as a corporate official of the Oklahoman 
and its parent company. So I called her and said, would you be interested in us having a party for you? Barbara and I'd like to do that uh, for your 80th birthday. Oh, she said, I'd love that. What a wonderful idea. She said, and it's my 80th birthday now. Do I have to ask 80 people? And I said, no, you can ask whoever you want. So she gave us the list, and the list was full of all the people that helped take care of her, that she depended on for help. It was all the caretakers that she'd had. It was the two waitresses from the Chinese restaurant that she loved. It was the bartender at Oak Tree. It was a lady named Cleo at Balliot's that sold her her clothes and Cleo's daughter, Lolly. And she walked in that night in the most gorgeous red kimono in, with this great aplomb and this great sophistication and sat down at the table and said when she got up to speak that it was the greatest gift she'd ever received from her father and that she treasured it more than anything she'd ever had. And, what a marvelous thing it was to be able to wear it. And she asked that she be buried in that, and sure enough, she was. The Oklahoma Heritage Association is proud to present the 85th Annual Oklahoma Hall of Fame Induction Ceremony. The induction of the late Edith Kinney Gaylord. It should have happened 40 years ago. On behalf of the Gaylord family, Louise and I thank the Oklahoma Heritage Association for bestowing upon our aunt, Edith Gaylord, the highest honor an Oklahoman can receive, induction into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. We know she would be so pleased to join her father, E.K. Gaylord, as a member. It's, it's the most well-deserved honor I can think of for her. She obviously wanted to make a difference after her own life, and she has. You know, this is the source of all the good that we're doing. Her legacy to us was an example of caring, compassion, philanthropy, and a lifelong love of learning. I wish our students could meet Edith Gaylord. I want to see that legacy of journalism continue for years and years so that the name Gaylord is associated with quality an educational opportunity for generations and generations to come. It's such an elegant, tiny, thoughtful woman. She had that strength at her core. She was a firecracker mentally, and uh, it just uh, it didn't matter how small she was. She was so big in her thoughts. She lived quietly and privately, even as she paved the way for women in journalism. When I try to make decisions, I do try to be a little more daring, a little more courageous, because of her inspiration. She made me feel like I had chosen the perfect career. There are very few people like that that can make you feel that good about yourself. I think Edith would have been very proud of our current efforts to uh, find those solutions to what will be the answers to keeping daily journalism going, uh, not just five years from now, but 10, 15, 20 years from now. I mean, that an incredible intellect, that incredible intellectual curiosity, the knowledge of history, the living through, the great journalist that she was. She really did have ink in her blood. Her presence was felt way across the state of Oklahoma. Edith really epitomized being kind to everyone and to give everyone a chance. Her giving, in many cases anonymously, made a difference in countless lives in Oklahoma and the nation and continues today through her foundations. Since 1982, Inasmuch Foundation has provided grants to 700 organizations totaling $123 million, continuing Edith's lifelong mission to enriching lives and lessening suffering. Working behind the scenes, not taking credit for these things, that's an amazing kind of thing to do. She was one of the most truly generous people I've ever known. She gave to the Rocky Mountains Park Preserve because she wanted that beautiful area that she loved to be preserved in a natural state for future generations as an environmentalist. She gave to the ACLU because she believed so passionately in the freedom of speech, even for people that espouse unpopular causes. She gave to civil rights organizations. She gave a great deal of money to literacy and to various educational efforts because she thought that liberated people and allowed them to achieve potential. She took care of people that were homeless 
and she took care of battered women through the shelter that she started here with the YWCA. She understood when other people had needs. If she believed in the cause, then she would be behind it. Our senior services, at-home support for seniors, uh, caregiver education, respite relief for family caregivers. The InasMuch Foundation helps us provide all of those services. Her career in journalism and her love for the news industry led her to establish Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation, which continues to make a significant impact on the future of journalism nationwide. Since 1982, this foundation has provided grants to 500 organizations, totaling $38 million. When she thought about her legacy and created these two foundations and provided them so much money. They can do big things and they can really have an impact in a, in a strategic way. I think it's wonderful that her legacy continues after her death and speaks even more loudly than she spoke. The little shot in the arm that organizations or schools or institutions needed, they have provided that in her name and she will not be forgotten. Our family appreciates this very special recognition for Edith. May her generous and pioneering spirit, highlighted here tonight, inspire you and others to give back and make a difference. Edith Gaylord was not a person that judged people by their last name or the size of their bank account. She judged people by the quality of their, their hearts and by their integrity and their character and the contributions to society. That's the person she was. The Gaylord family, and especially the women, I think have been really icons to many women in our community. But they've also shown a kind of depth and spirit and leadership that I think to some extent embodies Oklahoma, but sets a standard for women in our community to strive after. She was a brilliant wordsmith who focused on the details. I could tell many stories of how many people she helped across our state, nation, and even world through extraordinary philanthropy. All I can say is that my time with her was just beautiful and I can't imagine my life being anything more than it was those 35 plus years that I was with her. The best friend I've ever had. But the greatest gift from Edith to me, I think, was after her death. Vern Brown sent me this large box and it had every letter that I had written to Edith. Every funny postcard that we sent to her on vacations every clipping from my years as a freelance writer, and I'd send her the clippings when I'd get published. And she even sent back a pillow I'd made for her. And it was all there. And I was just in tears. This was a journal. It was four decades of letters. And it was priceless. Edith not only made a difference during her lifetime, but also ensured her giving would continue long after her death. She thoughtfully selected the name for each foundation, but left no specific directives for use of the funds, ensuring emerging issues of the day would be addressed. Part of the reason to have money is not just for your own comfort, but so that you can help other people, so that you can be good to other people. That's what true generosity is all about. It's not about yourself. It's about helping other people. Her focus was never on herself. In the last few years when she was not very uh, mobile and uh, we'd go to see her at her house in Oklahoma City, even in that situation, uh, her spiritedness never declined. Uh, she was a remarkable, sometimes feisty lady right to the, to the end of her life. I miss her. I miss her a lot. <laughs> We've got to share her story of compassion, of community, of learning, of independence, of looking at this diversity as an asset that we need to encourage, that we need to help others. These are important values. And it is incumbent on us today to teach our young people that these are the values that will make for a prosperous and a healthy and a happy community. And here is a woman whose life represents these values. Let's celebrate it, let's share it. Let's continue to encourage people to learn and to expand and to be part of this. Edith Kenny Gaylord's life helps us do that.
Edith invited me to go to a play down at OU, and uh, it was a Greek tragedy, uh, Agamemnon, I believe, or something like that. <laughs> they picked me up. We, we were going to eat dinner ahead of time and then go to the play. Well, we got down to Norman and thought we'd eat at the Holiday Inn, and either Edith or the friend had brought along a jug of martinis. That was one of my requirements, to make sure everything was ready for her martini. And she said, Mr. Bennett, I will just leave it at this. To make the perfect martini, one must truly, truly care. But Edith did give me the martini glasses after she passed away. We sat in the parking lot of the Holiday Inn and drank the martinis, and we never did get to dinner. And we got to the play, and I think I saw about one scene out of it, and I was off <laughs> for the rest of the play. She had like 60 martini glasses, and they were still in the box. Like they'd never been taken out of the box. So every time I make a martini, I, I dial in and, 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 and try to care and think about Edith, and that, that does make it just a little bit better. At first, I didn't know how to do it, but after being with her a while, I could mix them up for <laughs> I've sworn off martinis ever since then.